So before joining um, Penn, um, a professor at law was in uh, Columbia and then uh, CSMU. He has received many um, awards, including Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers, and the Google Faculty Research Award, and the Sloan Research Fellowship, and many, and many others. He is interested in he is interested in many research fields in computer science, including private data analysis, guidance in machine learning, game theory, and the mechanism design and the learning theory. Today, he will talk about his research in um, moment multi multi calibration for uncertainty estimation. So let's work with him. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Uh, and this is joint work with a bunch of people, some of whom are in the audience. Uh, and I want to preface this by saying that my background is not statistics. Um, so part of my reason for wanting to give this talk is to, to get uh, you know, feedback from real statisticians. Um, so if there are questions, certainly about like notation or anything like that, feel free to just unmute yourself and, and interrupt me during the talk. Uh, and I'll try to leave a few minutes at the end for, you know, questions more like, you know, why are you doing any of this in the first place? So, so maybe like clarification questions we can take online and, and questions intended to question the uh, like entire premise. We can, I'm eager to hear those, but we can take those at the end. Uh, and so what I want to think about first is what exactly reported probability estimates and uncertainty estimates mean. And uh, to ground this, let's imagine a personalized medicine setting. So um, there's a, a drug called warfarin that I know very little about, except that it's an anticoagulant. And it's an example of uh, a drug that requires a personalized medicine approach because its ideal dosage can differ substantially by orders of magnitude between people. And so it's a, it's a drug for which you would like to be able to train a statistical model uh, on observable features from a patient to try to predict their dosage. Okay, so imagine that, that you are a patient in need of this drug and you go into the doctor's office and then your doctor tells you, well, given your observable features X, I predict your stable warfarin dosage is something, some quantity F of X. Well, uh, you know, getting the wrong dosage can be dangerous, so, you, you, know, you, you might sensibly want to ask uh, the doctor how sure she is of this. And there's some things she could tell you. She could say, well, you know, the, the variance conditional on my estimate is something, it's G of X. You know, you could ask, okay, you know, can you, can you tell me anything else? And maybe she, she can look up in a medical journal and say, well, you know, there's a 95% prediction interval that your stable dosage falls between some particular lower bound L of X and some particular upper bound U of X. Okay, so, so you're the patient, you've, you've been told this. How should you interpret these estimates? And what you might um, hope for in an ideal world, the, the world in which these would be easiest to interpret, I, you might hope that all of these are sort of conditional estimates, conditional on all of your features. So for example, you might hope that f of x is uh, a conditional expectation, the expectation of your dosage conditional on all of your observable features. Similarly, you might hope that this prediction interval is a conditional prediction interval, meaning that conditional on all of your features, uh, the probability that your realized dosage fails to fall between the lower bound and the upper bound uh, is at most 5%. And in this ideal world, the randomness over which these expectations and probabilities are taken are entirely over the unrealized or unmeasured randomness of the world because we've conditioned on absolutely everything we know about you. Right? If, if this is what these things meant, then you could sort of there'd be a natural way to interpret these guarantees as a, as a um, prediction about you specifically. But it is likely that uh, that is not what these quantities are. So, um, you know, more likely, and this is in the good case, you know, it might be that these estimates actually have very few guarantees at all. But like in the good case, what is most likely is that this prediction f of x is not a, um, 
conditional expectation, conditional on all of your features, but is rather a, a forecaster that satisfies something weaker called calibration. And we'll, if, if you don't remember what calibration is, we'll define it in a moment. And similarly, it's likely that rather than a conditional prediction interval, what you have is a marginal prediction interval, which means that we are averaging over people. Right? A, a marginal 95% prediction interval is one such that for 95% of people, their realized label is, is covered by the interval. Okay, but crucially in all of these guarantees, uh, we are not taking these probabilities um, over somehow the unrealized or unmeasured randomness of the world. These are averages over different people. And so, you know, there's a good reason for this, right? Like, why don't we just provide these true conditional uh, probabilities? Well, th th that's just too much to hope for um, in a rich feature space without making very strong assumptions, right? Because in, in a rich feature space, it's likely that the doctor has never before encountered anyone exactly like you, meaning the doctor has never before encountered anyone who matches you precisely on all of your observable features. And so, of course, strictly speaking, if I've never seen your X before, I have no information at all on the conditional distribution of Y given X. And so I can't say anything at all about it. In you know, I can't give an expectation. I can't give a prediction interval. And of course, there's a couple of standard solutions. One is to make some parametric assumptions. For example, I, could, I, I might imagine that in an idealized world, um, you know, the, the label distribution has some expectation that is an unknown linear function of the features in, for example, an ordinary least squares model. And if I'm willing to make parametric assumptions, then I can form confidence regions around, uh, around my parameters. I can do inference. And I can translate these into prediction intervals. But of course, these prediction intervals are only valid if we believe the model. And you know, the model, of course, will ultimately be wrong, you know, even if the model is a very good approximation to the truth in aggregate, uh, interpreting the model as correct for a particular individual is, is dangerous. And then, of course, the other standard solution is to give up on these conditional guarantees and to, to move to marginal guarantees instead. That's what calibration does. That's what the conformal prediction literature does. Okay, so you know, should we be happy with, with marginal guarantees? Let's, let's think about that again in our, in our medical example. So, so the doctor tells you that um, she's got a 95% marginal prediction interval that your dosage falls between L of X and U of X. So you might think to yourself, for example, uh, well, you know, I'm part of a demographic group that represents less than 5% of the population. So it is consistent with this 95% marginal prediction interval, which is, remember, a, an average over, you know, everyone, that for me, right, like my true conditional prediction interval, you know, could be entirely disjoint from this marginal prediction interval, but is entirely consistent with the guarantees of a marginal prediction interval, and more generally, you know, even if my demographic group represents more than 5% of the population, uh, there's no particular reason to think that this marginal prediction interval, which is, again, a coarse average over possibly a uh, extremely heterogeneous population, says anything particularly informative about you. Okay. Um, you know, so maybe, maybe you ask your doctor, you know, yeah, yeah, that's, that's sort of the population wide average. What about for people like me? You know, look through your medical journal. Maybe there have been studies for people like me. Okay, and, and what does that mean, people like you? And so there's many different groups you might belong to. So the doctor might flip through her medical journal and say, well, okay, for African Americans under the age of 50, the 95% prediction interval ranges from A to B. And for women with a family history of diabetes, the 95% prediction interval ranges from C to D. And for people with egg allergies and no history of smoking, the 95% prediction interval ranges from E to F. And again, remember, you might be a member of each of these groups, 
And it is entirely consistent with the guarantees of a, of a marginal prediction interval that, for example, A to B is a disjoint interval from E to F. Right? So, so how should you interpret these guarantees? You're a member of each of these groups, and the sort of marginal probabilities look different in each of these groups. Right? So, so one conservative thing you could do is take the union of all of these intervals, for example. That is what some uh, prior work in statistics does, but that's, a, that's an extremely conservative thing to do. Okay, and you know, so there's, a, there's, a, there's something else you can do. Uh, and let me tell you about it. Let me walk you through sort of a simpler idea, not due to us, due to some prior work that tries to solve this problem, not for things like uncertainty estimation, but just for the estimation of expectations. Okay, so sort of a nice idea. Let me tell you about the original idea, and then I'll, I'll tell you about how we, we extend it to, to things like uncertainty estimation. So the setting that we're in is that there's some distribution over uh, features and labels. Okay, let's normalize things so that our labels are numbers between zero and one for now. And we're trying to come up with a mean predictor, some uh, you know, function which purports to predict, given a feature vector x, what is the conditional label distribution given x. And so let me introduce some notation. If we are given some subset of the feature space, then I want to write mu of s as the true conditional expectation for the label conditional on the fact that the features lie within the set s. And similarly, mu bar, which remember is our predictor, I want to define mu bar of s to be the expected value of our prediction for the label, again, conditional on the fact that X lies within this region S. And now, you know, here's a simple definition. We can say that our predictor is mean consistent on a set S if these two quantities are equal, right? If the true conditional expectation of the label, given that X is in S, uh, is equal to the true expected prediction that we give, given that X is in S, and we can relax this definition to be approximate. We can, we can say that a mean predictor is epsilon mean consistent on this set if these two quantities differ by only a little bit. And I'm going to parameterize only a little bit in a way that will turn out to be the correct way to do so when we start talking about finite sample guarantees. But essentially, it is going to be more difficult in terms of the number of samples we need to estimate the mean for small sets, sets that have small measure. And that's going to that's going to manifest itself in in my definition of approximate mean consistency. We'll say that an estimator is epsilon mean consistent on a set S if the difference between the true conditional mean and the conditional prediction of the label uh, differs by at most epsilon over the measure of the set S. Okay. Okay. And now, given this definition, let me remind you what calibration means, regular old calibration. Informally, what it means is that, um, you know, my predictions should be mean consistent, even conditional on the value of my prediction. So let's fix some discretization parameter m, okay? And I'm going to think about a, a grid of possible predictions I might make discretized by 1 over m. So I could predict 0, I could predict 1 over m, 2 over m, all the way up through 1. Now, I don't want to actually discretize my predictions, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bin them in these sort of discrete bins. And so I'm going to write that my prediction on some point x is in bin i if um, my prediction is closer to i over m than to any of the other predictions in this discrete grid. Okay, and, and maybe sort of for the purposes of this talk, you can just read this little piece of notation here as saying that our prediction is i over m. Okay, it doesn't have to be exactly i over m actually because we're allowing real valued predictions, but sort of the, the right mental model perhaps to read this bit of notation is that 
um, if mu hat of x is in bin i, that means we predict i over m. Okay, now one other piece of notation. Given some subset of the feature space, I want to write s of mu bar comma i to mean the points in this subset s such that my prediction was i. Okay, and now regular old calibration, like the standard notion of calibration that you might be familiar with, is just that a mean predictor is epsilon calibrated if for each value of i, if for each prediction it might make in this discrete bit, in this discretization, our predictor is actually epsilon mean consistent on the set of all points for which we predicted i. Okay, so for example, if we're predicting some binary outcome, like whether it's going to rain or not, calibration just means that on all of the days for which I predicted a 10% chance of rain, it should have rained 10% of the time. Similarly for 20%, 30%, and so on. And multi-calibration is uh, asking for almost the same thing that calibration is, except um, it's asking for this guarantee simultaneously for lots of different ways in which to slice up the feature space. Okay, so, so a guarantee of multi-calibration is parametrized by an arbitrary large collection of possibly overlapping sets. Okay, and we say that a mean predictor is epsilon multi-calibrated with respect to this collection of sets G if not just for every prediction we might make, but also for every subset of points within G, that our mean predictor is mean consistent on the subset of points S on which we made prediction I. So this is just saying that we should be calibrated not just overall, but our predictor should simultaneously be calibrated on every single conditional distribution that I could induce by conditioning that the feature vector x lied within one of these sets s. Okay, so, you know, said another way, what mean calibration means is the average label amongst all points for which we predicted mean i over m should be i over m. And multi-calibration just means that this statement should be true, not just overall, but also simultaneously Simultaneously conditioning on your point X falling within any of these sets S on which we are multi-calibrated. And, and so now I want to think, okay, you know, is the, what's an analog of calibration that I could ask for for moments, for example, for variances? And just by pattern matching, you might, you know, think the following, um, right? By pattern matching, it seems like maybe I should ask the following, the variance or like the true distributional variance on the set of all points for which we predicted variance i over m should be i over m. Now, if you think about it for just a little bit longer, you sort of realize that this is not a good definition um, for the following reason. You know, one way to think about multi-calibration for means is that it is asking you to come up with a statistical estimator that is indistinguishable from the true conditional distribution on labels given X um, with respect to some class of statistical tests. And those statistical tests all have the form of uh, computing, computing an expectation or an average over some group. And the nice thing about this is that expectations are linear. And so in particular, um, you know, if I knew somehow the true conditional distribution on labels given features, this true distribution would perfectly satisfy uh, multi-calibration, right? You'd be like perfectly multi-calibrated for an arbitrary set of groups. And so multi-calibration is just asking for a set of constraints that are perfectly satisfied by the true distribution. The more constraints you add, sort of the harder it is to distinguish your, um, predictor from, from the true underlying distribution. And, and the problem is that expectations combine linearly, but variances and other higher moments do not. Okay, so, so this property that 
we might have asked for by pattern matching is not a good one because it's not satisfied by the true underlying distribution. Right, let me let me give you sort of a you know very simple example that just illustrates this point. Suppose my distribution P is such that there's only two kinds of points, call them X1 and X2. And suppose that the true labels uh, are perfectly, you know, um, fixed by the, by the features. Once I know the features, there's no remaining stochasticity at all, right? So if I knew the features are X1, I know for sure the labels are zero. If I knew the features are X2, I know for sure the label is one. So, you know, if I knew the, so what, so what is the true conditional variance uh, on the labels given the features? Well, for every point it's zero, right? Like conditioning on X1, uh, the variance of the label is zero. Conditioning on X2, the variance of the label is zero. And, and so uh, the true distribution would predict variance zero for both of these points. And yet, if I look at the subset of the distribution on which my predictor makes prediction variance zero, well, that's everything. And the true variance of the underlying population, if I first sample a point and then sample the label conditional on the point, is not zero because now the label is a coin flip, it's a quarter, okay? So the true distribution satisfies mean calibration if it's defined like this, basically that averages should be correct, but it does not satisfy, for example, variance calibration. And, and so simply asking for um, this analog of mean calibration is not the right thing to do. And, and just sort of saying that more generally, the underlying problem here is that expectations, means, these combine linearly over mixtures. So if I have a mixture of a bunch of random variables, then the mean of the mixture is just the corresponding average of the means of the mixture components. But that's not true for, for higher moments. You, know, you can look up on Wikipedia what the formula is for uh, the, the variance or the third or fourth central moment of a mixture distribution, and it is, it is nonlinear. But one observation that is going to be helpful for us is that this, you know, complicated uh, non-convex expression here does become linear. It becomes just an average. If it happens to be that all of the mixture components in our mixture distribution have the same mean, right? If, if the mean of every random variable in our mixture is the same, is equal to the mean of our mixture, then all of these terms here that are sort of leading to the annoying non-convexity um, evaluate to zero. And indeed, we get that the variance of the mixture distribution is just the corresponding uh, average of the variances of the mixture components. Okay, so, so if we somehow could guarantee that we were only ever talking about mixtures of points that had the same mean, then, um, then, then higher moments would sort of behave linearly just as means do. Okay, and that's going to sort of be the, um, you know, moral motivation, maybe the, the background for how you might come to propose what I'm going to talk about, which I'll call mean conditioned moment multi-calibration. Okay, so let me, let me give you some more notation. So again, let's imagine that we have a moment predictor, okay, some, some predictor mk bar that, that purports to predict the, um, the true kth central moment of the label distribution y conditional on features x. Okay, so, you know, we have the true kth central moment, right? And let's say that the true kth central moment uh, of a set S is just the expectation of the realization of the label minus the mean of the label uh, raised to the kth power conditional on the features lying within the set S. Okay, this is sort of the thing we'd like to imitate. And I will define MK bar of S to be just the average, the expectation over the set S, the conditional expectation given that X is within the set S of my prediction of the case central moment. Okay? And 
by analogy to what we were talking about for means, I want to define a predictor to be epsilon moment consistent on a set S if um, the true kth central moment conditional on X being in S is equal to the average of our predictions of the kth central moment. And again, we can define an approximate version of this parameterized by epsilon and the correct thing to do down the line will be to allow this approximation um, to get worse, the smaller the measure of the set S. Okay, and, and remember, as we just discussed, it does not make sense to ask that a predictor be moment consistent on every set S, because in particular, the true distribution will not satisfy that property. Okay, but we can ask for something similar. So again, by analogy to what we talked about for mean calibration, given a set S, Let's talk about the set of all points for which we predict that the mean is i, i over m, and we predict that the kth central moment is j over m. Okay, this is the subset of the feature space for which our mean predictor predicts i over m and our moment predictor predicts j over m. So if we have a pair of such predictors, a mean predictor and a moment predictor, I wanna say that they are mean conditioned moment multi-calibrated on some collection of sets G. Again, think of G as consisting of a very rich, uh, possibly intersecting collection of sets, like this corresponds to the different demographic groups, for example, in our, in our leading example. And what I want is that for every demographic group, for every subset of, of uh, features in my, in my collection of sets G, and for every pair of predictions i and j that I might make for the mean and for the moment, that my mean predictor should be mean consistent on this set, the set of all people for which I predict i for the mean and j for the moment. And simultaneously, my moment predictor should be moment consistent on this set, the set of all people for which I predict i for the mean and j for the moment. And the only thing I want you to observe about this right now is that this is something that is satisfied by the true distributional quantities. That is, if, if mu hat was the true conditional expectation of the label um, given the features, and if mk bar was the true, um, the true value of the kth moment, again, conditional on the features, um, this pair would in fact be mean conditioned moment multi-calibrated. And the reason is because we are asking for moment consistency only on sets that have the same mean, the same mean prediction. But remember, if these were the true distributional quantities, those would really correspond to the same mean. And those are exactly the sets on which it makes sense to ask for moment consistency in this way. Okay. Okay, and before I tell you how to achieve this, let me walk through sort of um, maybe why you would want to achieve it. So sort of what it would mean if the estimators given by the doctor were mean condition multi moment multi-calibrated. Okay, and first let's start with the most straightforward interpretation. Like what does this mean? Like just like verbatim reading off from the definition. Okay, so, so the doctor now has a, a mean predictor and predicts that your ideal dosage is V hat and also has a variance predictor, predicts that for you, the, the variance of your ideal dosage is, is sigma hat. So most straightforwardly, what you can now deduce is that amongst all people who received the same pair of predictions, their true average dosage really was V hat and the true variance of their realized, you know, ideal dosages was indeed sigma hat. And more importantly, this is true, not just overall as averaged um, across the whole population, but this is true as an average, even conditional on being a member of any of the demographic groups that are contained within the set G. And moreover, you know, we don't have a separate estimate for each demographic group. 
right? Like that's the nice thing. We don't have a separate estimate for each demographic group, which is what makes it hard to interpret these numbers if you're a member of all of them, right? You receive a, a single, you know, a single estimate, right? V hat and sigma hat, and you can at your option correctly interpret these values as averages simultaneously over any of the demographic groups for which you are a member. Okay. So that's what mean condition moment multi-calibration means sort of uh, most straightforwardly if you just read off the definition. And I also want to point out that you can use mean conditioned moment multi-calibrated estimates just as you would use real moments, because actually they are real moments of the induced distributions on these sets S corresponding to restrictions of any of the demographic groups you care about uh, to the set of points for which your mean prediction was I and your moment prediction was J. Okay, so let me give you an example. So one thing moments are useful for are, are tail bounds, right? Like if I know the mean of a random variable and I know its variance, then I can use Chebyshev's inequality to bound the property that, or to, to bound the probability that the realization of the random variable differs from its mean by more than t. Okay, that's what I can do if I have uh, variance, but it turns out I can do the same thing. I get even tighter bounds typically if I know the higher moments as well. And so, for example, one way you could use that if I knew the true distribution, if I need the true moments of the distribution of the labels conditional on your features X, I could use that to compute a prediction interval, right? I could, I could compute a prediction interval centered at your mean, uh, and this would be a, a true like conditional prediction interval if I knew the true moments of the conditional distribution on labels given your features. So it turns out that if it, if, if I don't have the true moments, but I have mean conditioned moment multi-calibrated estimators, I can compute exactly the same quantity, right? Exactly the same interval, except instead of true means, I'm using my mean predictions. Instead of true moments, I'm using my moment predictions. And this will also be a valid prediction interval. It will no longer be a conditional prediction interval, conditional on all of your features, but it will be a correct prediction interval as averaged over all of these finely defined sets. And, and once again, the nice thing here is that this guarantee of, of, of validity is simultaneously true for all of the sets, all of the demographic groups within this collection of, of points G. Okay, so you can correctly interpret this uh, prediction interval as a marginal prediction interval, not as averaged over the whole population, but as averaged over any of these demographic groups for which you're a member of, and you don't have to pick and choose. Okay. Uh, Adam, I don't, I have a, I have a quick question in, in the last slide. Uh, yeah. So this is Victor. Um, are you still assuming that Y is in zero one? Um, y is in uh, zero one in this particular calculation, but um, like, like in general, we don't need to assume that. But for this talk, yeah, let's assume it's normalized between zero and one. I believe if you don't assume zero one, then K has to be an even number, right? For the previous bound to be true. For um, the bound in the previous slide. Well, yeah, that, that's right. So these are for even moments. Okay, good. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure. Uh, you can that. put absolute values here for odd moments, but uh, yeah, that's, that's right. detail I don't want to get into. Okay, okay, good. Thank uh, you. But, but, but yes, you know, if you want to think about these as even moments, but you know, if you really want to use odd moments, you can do all of this as well. You just have to redefine something with mm. absolute values. Yeah, all right. Thank Thanks. you. Okay, so how do we, how do we achieve something like this? And, and you know, let's, let's think about first just mean consistency or mean multi-calibration, and then we'll think about how do we, how do we generalize that to this sort of, uh, mean conditioned moment multi-calibration. And, and let's first start out with like a somewhat more ambitious goal. Okay, so suppose that we wanted to find a predictor mu hat that was mean consistent simultaneously on every subset of the feature space X. Okay, so, so like if I wanted like actually perfect mean consistency with epsilon equals zero on every subset, I'd have to learn the, I'd have to learn the true conditional label distribution. Um, in the end, we're gonna, you know, be happy with approximate versions of this. 
okay? But I can view this as a min-max problem where I want to minimize over the set of all mean predictors the maximum deviate, the maximum absolute value deviation. Here I'm sort of uh, achieving an absolute value by multiplying the sort of uh, deviation from my predictions and the truth mm -hmm. by a number that's at the option of the maximization player, either one or minus one. So that has the effect of making this an absolute value. I want to minimize the maximum absolute value deviation of the true uh, mean of the labels on a set S uh, compared to my predictions on that set S. Okay. And I've written that by multiplying by the, um, by the measure of the set S. Okay. Because remember, these are conditional probabilities. Okay, so these are sort of not linear objects on their own, but multiplying by the uh, measure of the set S, which would sort of show up in the denominator of these conditional probabilities, linearizes them. Okay, so if I, if I linearize them like so, okay, I maintain the property that if I can, um, you know, get this quantity equal to zero, I, I will have for sure learned the uh, true label distribution, the true conditional label distribution. Uh, but the result of, of linearizing these terms is that this is now just a convex program. In fact, a linear program. This is just a, a sort of prog a linear program with one linear constraint for every set S. Okay, and we can solve it with gradient descent. And so here's some, you know, version of gradient descent, okay, in a somewhat general form. Okay, so we start with some initial mean predictor, okay, some function mapping uh, feature vectors to, to numbers between zero and one. And in rounds, you know, think about this perhaps as playing against a, a, an audit player who's going to look at your mean predictor and, and try to um, exhibit for it a set of points S for which you are not yet mean consistent. Okay, in rounds, the audit player will, will show you some set S, probably one on which you're not mean consistent, and you, the gradient descent player, will just do a gradient descent step on this set of points. You will change your prediction on the set of points in the set and not change your prediction on the set of points not in the set. So if you go through a relatively standard gradient descent analysis, what you find is the following. You know, if indeed what the audit player is doing is at every round exhibiting a set S on which you are not alpha mean consistent, if there is any set S, then this interaction cannot go on for more than one over alpha squared many rounds because after one over alpha squared many rounds on which you have done a gradient descent update on a set on which you are not alpha mean consistent, you must in fact be alpha mean consistent on every remaining set. Okay, this is sort of falls out of a relatively standard gradient descent kind of analysis. Okay, so this gives an algorithm for coming up with a predictor that is mean multi-calibrated. Okay. Like, like at any given moment, at any given step of gradient descent, we have some candidate mean predictor, okay? If the audit player is always going to look around and try to identify some set S mu I, uh, witnessing a failure of epsilon multi-calibration, then this process will converge in, in fewer than one over epsilon squared many rounds right? Because either before one over epsilon squared many rounds, uh, the audit player will be unable to continue. There will be no more sets witnessing a failure of multi-calibration, in which case we're done. Uh, or else, if it really continues for one over epsilon squared many rounds, then in fact, we're epsilon mean consistent, not just on these sets witnessing epsilon multi-calibration, but on, but on everything. Okay. And, and just a note for later, 
this argument has nothing to do with the particular structure of these sets. The same argument works for finding a predictor that is epsilon mean consistent on any like well-defined collection of sets. And so again, you'd like to try to generalize this to some notion of moment multi-calibration, but the main obstacle is that uh, moments, unlike means, are, are non-linear or non-convex. And so we can't exactly just write out the same min-max optimization problem, but for moments and, and uh, appeal to gradient descent. And so here's, you know, maybe a somewhat naive idea, naive in that it doesn't work on its own, but is pointing us in the right direction. Okay, like, like suppose we'd already computed a mean predictor that was pretty good. Perhaps it was multi-calibrated, right? Like, we could define pseudo moment labels, right? I could just like imagine that the label for some point X was equal to Y minus our mean prediction for the point X raised to the kth power and ask for mean consistency with respect to these moment like labels. Okay, and, and we might call this pseudo moment consistency. And the reason this seems like it might be a sensible thing to do, well, first of all, uh, you know, mean consistency with respect to these labels actually would correspond to moment consistency if our mean predictor was the true, you know, distributional quantity, the true, um, you know, conditional expectation on Y conditional on X, because, because then the expectation of this quantity over some set um, would be like the kth moment. The problem, of course, is that mu bar, our estimate for what the means are, is not the true distributional quantity. But note also that once we fix any mu bar, we can use the gradient descent algorithm we just talked about to um, achieve mean consistency with respect to these, these now invented labels, which we just called pseudo moment consistency, because our gradient descent algorithm uh, didn't care at all where, what the labels looked like. It assumed no structure on the labels, and so it works equally well on the real labels and arbitrary invented labels. And one thing that you can prove uh, is the following. So suppose that I have a pair, you know, a mean predictor and a moment predictor, that satisfy the following simultaneously. For every set S on which I want to be multi-calibrated, for every mean prediction i and for every moment prediction j, then if I look at all of the points within S for which I predicted mean i and moment j, my mean predictor is mean consistent, epsilon mean consistent, and simultaneously on the same set of, the same collection of sets, my moment predictor is uh, epsilon pseudo moment consistent, then in fact my pair mu bar and mk bar, my mean predictor and my moment predictor, are together mean conditioned moment multi-calibrated. This, this uh, property that we wanted, where the, the sort of approximation parameter has gotten worse by a factor of k. Remember, we're trying to predict k moments here, but not by worse than that. Okay, so, so here's a lemma, you know, it's half a page of algebra, um, it's true. But it doesn't get us all the way there, right? Uh, you know, it gives us a goal to shoot for, right? We wanna find a pair, a mean predictor and a moment predictor that jointly satisfy these consistency conditions. But the problem is that uh, these consistency condi conditions have certain dependencies. Right? In particular, the sets S on which our mean predictor must be mean consistent are defined in terms of the moment predictor. So these sets aren't defined you know, for, for the mean predictor until we've established what the moment predictor is. But the moment predictor is supposed to be, um, you know, it's supposed to be a pseudo moment multi-calibrated with respect to labels that aren't even defined until we fix the mean predictor. Okay, so, so the, the, the sort of problem initially is that condition one isn't defined until we fix the moment predictor but condition two isn't defined until we fix the mean predictor. But like nevertheless, it gives us a target to shoot for. And um, our goal here is going to be to find predictors 
that simultaneously satisfy the hypotheses of the lemma I just showed you. And then the conclusion that we're going to get out is that we, we successfully achieve mean condition, moment multi-calibration, and all of the nice things that come with it. And one observation, right, is that either condition on its own is just asking for mean consistency on some collection of sets. So if I fix my moment predictor, then condition one is something I know how to achieve. It's just mean consistency on some collection of sets that are defined once I fix the moment predictor. Similarly, once I fix the mean predictor, I can achieve the pseudo moment calibration condition because it is once again, just a collection of mean consistency constraints defined with respect to these pseudo moment labels that are fixed once I fix the mean predictor. And so a natural idea that will in fact work in this case is alternating gradient descent. Okay, we're gonna um, fix a mean predictor and then we're gonna run gradient descent to find moment predictors that are pseudo moment consistent with respect to these labels uh, defined by the mean predictor. And then once we do that, we might find that there are sets on which this mean predictor is supposed to be mean consistent, but it isn't. But those sets are at least defined once we've fixed the moment predictor and we'll update now on the mean predictor and we'll just alternate back and forth and hopefully this will work. Okay, and so don't, I'll walk you through this. Don't try to like read the pseudocode right now, but this is just alternating gradient descent. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna start with arbitrary initializations for our mean predictors and our moment predictors. We're gonna try to simultaneously find moment predictors for every moment ranging from two to K. And we're just gonna iterate until we're done. We're gonna ask ourselves, hmm, you know, given my current mean predictor and given my current moment predictor, that defines all of the sets on which my mean predictor is supposed to be mean consistent. If there are any sets on which um, we are not mean consistent, let's do a gradient descent update to make progress towards being mean consistent on these sets. Once we've done that, we've got a new mean predictor. We will look at all of our moment predictors, right? This will define a new set of pseudo moment labels on which I wanna be consistent. And we will do gradient descent to find moment predictors that are pseudo moment consistent on the appropriate collection of sets with respect to those pseudo moment labels. And we'll just continue until we um, satisfy both conditions of our lemma. And the reason this is going to work is because remember our analysis of gradient descent for mean consistency had nothing to do with the form of the sets we found. Right, it said, you just cannot go on finding sets that are substantial, that, that sort of um, represent substantial violations of mean consistency for very long um, before it is impossible to find more such sets because if you go on beyond one over epsilon squared many rounds, you will be mean consistent on every set, okay? And that basically means that this outer loop in which we do updates on our mean predictor can't continue for more than one over epsilon squared many rounds. And similarly, this inner loop in which we try to find pseudo moment consistent estimators, well, that similarly takes at most one over epsilon squared many rounds. And so the, the theorem in the end that you get out says that because of the convergence guarantees of these two nested loops, after at most one over epsilon to the fourth many rounds, you will get uh, as output a whole slate of predictors, a mean predictor, a predictor for the second moment, third moment, all the way through K, such that the mean predictor is mean multi-calibrated with respect to your collection of sets G. And simultaneously, uh, your mean predictor paired with each of your moment predictors are epsilon mean conditioned moment multi-calibrated. Uh, a couple of details since I presented this as if we had direct access to the distribution. You can work out finite sample guarantees, okay? Uh, you don't need direct access to the distribution. And the number of samples you need scales with the number of iterations of the algorithm. So this looks like k cubed over epsilon to the fourth times only the log of the number of groups you care to be multi-calibrated with respect to which is very nice. It means that in terms of your sample complexity, 
you can really take G, the set of demographic groups you care about, to be enormous, okay, divided by epsilon squared, your error. And the algorithm naively needs to enumerate through the, this collection of groups G at every iteration because we, we need to try to find a set S within this group, within this collection of groups G that witnesses one of these mean consistency violations. Okay, so that means that you know, even without any additional cleverness, you can implement this algorithm in time that is linear in the number of groups that you care about. But it turns out you can replace this enumeration step with um, the ability to solve some empirical risk minimization problem, some learning problem over G. So if you have a heuristic that you think is good at solving linear learning problems, for example, you can replace this enumeration step with, with a single call to, to this learning algorithm. Okay, so I'm, you know, I want to leave a couple of minutes for questions. Uh, so let me not talk about the online setting. But let me just point out that in some ongoing work, we basically show you can do all of this uh, without any distributional assumptions at all. Okay, so what you can do is you can make predictions as examples arrive. You do not need to assume that these examples are drawn from a distribution. They could be chosen by an adversary. And even in this setting, you can make predictions that are um, on you know, that quickly converge on the sort of empirical history of examples you've seen to be um, mean multi-calibrated uh, or to, to give prediction intervals that are sort of correct 95% prediction intervals, for example, even as averaged over any of these demographic groups that you care about. And, and this um, online setting which, in which you give prediction intervals solves the same problem as, as conformal prediction does, except without any assumptions. Right? You, you don't need any sort of distributional or exchangeability assumptions. Okay, so I don't have time to talk about that, but you know, if anyone's interested, you can ask me later. Uh, and with that, let me end. Thank you. And let me just say that, so for the part of the talk I actually got to, where we talk about moment multi-calibration, there's a paper online that you can read. And for the, the online problem in, in which we solve this conformal prediction problem, uh, that is something that we're working on now and will hopefully be online in a couple of months. All right, so I'll, I'll end there and ask if there's any questions. I have one, Aaron. Go ahead, Frank. Um, yeah, thanks. That was just really stimulating. Um, I guess, I mean, presumably there's a predictive trade-off between the protection from discrimination achieved by multi-calibration and the accuracy of the prediction itself. Um, is that right? And if so, has it been quantified? And, and how does that trade-off change as you bring in higher moments? Yes, yeah, so there's, there's, um, there's not an inherent trade-off here. And I'll just note that um, perfect predictions would satisfy, or like, if, like in the ideal case, both for accuracy and for these kinds of multi-calibration moments, so these, these multi-calibration notions, in the ideal case, you would know the true conditional label distribution conditional on everyone's features, right? Like you'd love to know that. If you knew that, you couldn't possibly make more accurate predictions and that would also satisfy all of these multi-calibration notions. And so, there's not necessarily um, any trade-off involved here. So there's not necessarily a trade-off, but there may be, right? Um, so there, you know, in practice, there. So there's certainly a trade-off in terms of computation, in the sense that, um, you know, these algorithms that that result in multi-calibrated predictors require basically that you run some um, learning algorithm, not just once, but many, many times, uh, sort of at each step of, of this gradient descent. So it's more expensive computationally to come up with multi-calibrated predictors. And I don't know for a moment multi-calibration whether it may be that you end up with a somewhat less accurate predictor at the end, although, you know, sort of morally you shouldn't in that this multi-accuracy 
objective is really an accuracy objective. That this multi-calibration objective is really an accuracy objective. But accuracy objective or, or fairness? Well, it has um, it's it's obviously desirable for fairness, but but again, it's an accuracy objective in that if you could optimize your multi-calibration error to zero, right, the only thing that would achieve zero multi-calibration error would be the true conditional label distribution given the Ah, feature. ah, ah, yeah, good point. Thank you. Yeah. Is there any other question for our speaker? Okay, so if there is no more question, let's thank Aaron for this wonderful talk.